Hello guys, welcome back. Um, today we're on our fourth episode where we're going to be applying the systems approach that we've been using so far onto water, water systems. Um, so we're going to be thinking about flows, transformations, and applying all of the different laws that any system obeys to water, which is quite exciting. So Let's think about why water is important. Why does the IB dedicate a whole topic to it in ESS? Well, water keeps us alive, right? It um, moderates climate, it sculpts the land, it's really um, at the core of Earth's functioning, really. Um, so it also removes um, wastes and dilutes them, and it's part of one of the biggest cycles on Earth, which is the water cycle or the hydrological cycle that we will go over later on. So you can see that water is involved in really a wide variety of kind of roles on Earth and in ecosystems. So it makes sense that we're looking at it in such depth. So thinking about the Earth's water budget, there's really a limited amount of water available to us, uh, specifically in a form that's usable, as you will see in the next slide. But in terms of water as a resource, it can be considered both renewable and non-renewable. And if you need a reminder of what those two terms mean, renewable resources are ones that can be used at a rate that is replenishable. So you're living on the income that the natural capital is providing. Non-renewable resources, on the other hand, you cannot use sustainably. So using them will inevitably be going into the natural capital, uh, which means that it's reducing its ability to regenerate at the rate that it's doing today. Um, so Oceans can be considered a non-renewable resource, uh, whereas the atmosphere, so water particles there, can be considered renewable. And we'll explore this concept further as well. Um, I also want to introduce to you guys turnover time, which is the time taken for water to completely cycle in the water cycle and return to a point. Um, and again, we'll get back to these concepts momentarily. So let's look at the Earth's water budget. So this diagram, I'm sure maybe you guys have seen it before, I've seen it so many times, but it shows you really well how the vast majority of water on Earth isn't in a usable form. First of all, only 3% is fresh water, and of those 3%, around 70% is in ice caps or glaciers, so again, unavailable. So this really shows you the, the kind of distribution of Earth's water in terms of what we can use. So already you've hopefully seen that water scarcity is a problem. Um, and not only has this already been a problem, but many parts of the world are experiencing further water scarcity. So rivers running dry, lakes and seas shrinking, um, and water bodies being over pumped in such an unsustainable rate that the problem is increasing. Um, so I hope that makes it clear that the lack of water is an issue. Um, so let's have a look at the typical water cycle and the, the different storages and flows that it has. So again, we're now we're applying the systems approach to water um, by identifying the storages and how water can flow between them. And as with all other systems on Earth, remember that the sun is the driving force for basically all reactions. So the storages in the water cycle are organisms, soil, water bodies like aquifers, oceans, rivers, um, and the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a really big one. Um, flows between them include evaporation, condensation, runoff, and precipitation, which you can see here. So you can see that water rises from oceans to the atmosphere via evaporation. Um, the opposite is precipitation, which can fall on the earth and then runoff in between different small bodies of water uh, is a big transfer as well. So this is what typically happens um, and how water typically moves around the earth. Now, humans can have a huge impact on the hydrological cycle at several levels. So agriculture includes pesticides and fertilizers, which can um, affect runoff and cause eutrophication, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, through deforestation, we remove plants which typically and usually uh, create a shield and basically protect the soil from water and wind erosion, which is basically water and wind damage. It's when they affect the quality of the soil, as we'll see in episode five. Um, 
Desertification as caused by climate change. Climate change and global warming, of course, are a huge factor influencing the hydrological cycle. They uh, increase um, evaporation rates and uh, cause desertification of land. And the, the fourth is over pumping of aquifers. So uh, aquifers are a really great example of water as a non-renewable resource because aquifers take around 1,500 years to replenish. Uh, so the turnover time that I mentioned earlier. And this, I, I hope you can see, is impossible for us to use at a sustainable rate because of how long it takes to replenish. So uh, we still over pump them. And these are, I think, the main ways that we impact, we as humans impact the hydrological cycle. So the issue of water scarcity is, we've made clear, um, but the issue isn't only the amount of water available, but how we use that water. Um, and the two largest sectors are industry and agriculture. So agriculture around 70%, industry 20%. Um, and the distribution worldwide is uneven. So not all nations have equal access to the water that is available. Um, and But the crucial thing is that most water that we do withdraw from rivers, lakes, and aquifers is done at an unsustainable rate. So again, faster than the, than the environment can withstand and faster than it can replenish itself. Um, so sustainable use of water would mean using it at a rate that doesn't deplenish the stock. So uh, sources of fresh water include lakes, rivers, and streams, but aquifers are the unsustainable, um, non-renewable resource that we shouldn't use because replacing it happens in a very, very slow process. Um, because we need to account for the fact that water has to infiltrate soil and rock in order to access those underground levels. Two main problems when it comes to water systems are water scarcity and water degradation. Um, water scarcity is the lack of water. We've mentioned this already. Um, and the fact that a lot of countries on earth have a growing population means that there's increased demand on this resource. We've also mentioned how climate change and our wasteful agricultural practices impact water scarcity as well. And of course, over pumping aquifers, over pumping this non-renewable resource that we are unable to use sustainably. So what are some solutions to these problems? Well, it includes efficient domestic use and just making sure that we're minimizing the individual waste of water and rainwater recycling and harvesting rainwater as well. Um, drip irrigation and watering at night are two ways to reduce evaporation and also reduce waste of water. So um, these are ways that we have a lack of water and ways that we can maybe compensate for that. And secondly, it's water degradation. So how we kind of pollute and damage the water that we do have access to. So this includes contamination with arsenic, salts, and other minerals. Um, use of fertilizers and pesticides can cause eutrophication, which will be in my next slide. Um, so releasing pollutants directly into waterways from factories. Um, and also salinization of topsoils due to fast evaporation rates as a result of climate change. So what are some solutions to this? Um, organic farming methods to minimize eutrophication and minimize impact on the hydrological cycle. Um, if we do use pesticides, make sure that they're highly selective species that wouldn't, uh, they're highly selective to certain species and wouldn't damage the overall ecosystem. Um, removing pollutants from wastewater plants um, and legislation and regulation at the highest level. So these are the two main problems and how to tackle them. And I appreciate I've gone over them fairly quickly, but I do want to introduce the two concepts to you now. And the final process that I want to introduce to you guys is that of eutrophication, which is basically when a body of water receives an excess input of nutrients, namely phosphates and nitrates that come primarily from fertilizers. Um, and this causes an excess growth of plants and phytoplankton, which you can see in the picture below. What, what happens next is there's an increase in turbidity, so how murky the water is, and it blocks the access of light to the submerged plants, which of course causes them to die. Um, in turn, there is an accumulation of dead organic matter and more food for decomposers, which as they break down the dead organic, ma organic matter, leads to hypoxic water, so low oxygen water. 
Um, and all of this accumulated decreases biodiversity because you're left with an environment that not many species can withstand. So it's very low oxygen. Um, and that is one of, one of the final processes that they, they teach you about in topic four. So that's all I'm going to tell you about regarding topic four. As always, make sure to check out our website to see some other things we could do for you guys. Um, but yeah, I'll see you in topic five. We are officially halfway.